You're listening to the Live Life Longer Show with Dan Voss, where we discuss longevity, anti-aging practices, biohacking, having more energy, and living a happier, healthier life. In today's episode, I interview Dr. Denise Ritter Bernardini about breathwork, biohacking, intermittent fasting, and the best supplements for health. Denise has taught voice for over 20 years. She holds degrees in vocal pedagogy and vocal performance, as well as certifications in neurolinguistic programming, and has extensively studied various methods of breathing and breath work. Dr. Bernardini's passion is biohacking and helping both the performer and the speaker work to maintain optimal lung capacity. You can find information about her courses and free seminars on deniseritterbernardini.com. Her book, Mindfulness of Singing, A Transformational Journey Using the Power of the Voice, co-written with Tony Crowder, is due to be released in 2021. Denise, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be a guest on your show. I've been listening and- Oh, good. Thank you. I'm honored to be among so many distinguished guests. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. It's it's an honor to have you on today. And we're going to be talking about vocal performance and singing and breath work. So I'm really excited to learn more about some of the things that you offer to the people that you work with in terms of improving breath work to, uh, to really improve their vocal performance and, and also biohacking as well, because I know you're into that. So I am. Uh, very cool. So let's get started. I'd like to kind of get started with uh, your story and how you kind of got into this field. Um, so why don't you just kind of walk us through how did you get into vocal performance and singing and how you incorporate breath work and now kind of biohacking your voice? Okay, well, that's a really long story. So <laughs> get out your martinis and whatever help you may need. And your, your coffee. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or whatever, whatever it takes for you. Uh, uh, so I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a PK and yes, Mm -hmm. everything you've ever heard about that's true. (laughs) Uh, and I, um, I've been singing since I was five. I mean, it was just something we did as a family and we did Mm -hmm. it during church and, and, uh, all of those things. Right. So, um, but my family are all gospel music musicians. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went down a little different path. Um, I decided I wanted to, and I've been playing piano since I was five too. So music was just always in the house and always sure. part of the thing. But I saw an opera as a young 20 something year old and couldn't believe this woman was laying on a stage singing high C's with no microphone over an orchestra. And hmm. I was like, what is that about? Yeah. I want to know how to do that. <laughs> So I, I went back to school and I had been living in Nashville and doing studio work and working mm-hmm. as a studio musician um, a little bit and traveling with a group. And I'd been in college, but kind of dropped out because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be in that, that gospel music space and felt like I didn't really need a college degree for that. So um, and I didn't really like school and, and in part because I, at the time I was a business major, I wasn't mm-hmm. even a voice major. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really understand the classical space. You know, it wasn't my, it was just something I wasn't raised around. So I sure. didn't really understand the classical space, but saw this opera. Somebody gave me tickets for my birthday, went to see it and was just blown away by it and wow. fell in love immediately. Like, like literally almost had a religious experience. Wow. That's cool. Yes. So, um, I, I went back to school and I, uh, laid a uh, recording of my favorite soprano on Mm. the desk, my voice teacher and said, whatever you got to do to make me sing like that, that's what I want to do. He said, okay. So, um, we, we worked really hard. I had kind of this overdeveloped chess voice because mm-hmm. of the gospel singing and didn't really have things on the other end. And so we worked and I, I finished up my degree and was, a, and, you know, went into the teaching of, of music mm-hmm. uh, career and then went back and got my master's degree. And somebody said, you really should be performing. And so I, from there on out, I did a lot of regional uh, oratorio and opera and concerts and 
sang at Carnegie Hall and stuff like that. So very cool. So I um, just really uh, loved the classical genre, especially mm-hmm. opera. But I have to tell you that opera is not a thing that you listen to. Mm. Opera is a thing you see. It is a full sensory experience. And if you are not an opera fan and you don't know an opera and you just listen to it, you're going to go, what is that crap? Mm-hmm. I hate that. And I get it because yep. I, I don't listen to opera in the car. Sure. No, I want to see it. I want to see uh, the spectacle that it is. It's yep. not called grand opera for nothing. It's sure beautiful costumes. It's beautiful staging. It's beautiful um, sets. It's a, a, an amazing storyline. It's, mm. it's musical theater on crack is what it yep. is. Yep. So if you like musical theater and, and you think you're not going to like opera, I would encourage you before you make that decision to go see an actual opera and, 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 and see one that's really funny or that's lighter because mm-hmm. that'll get you ready for the next one, which all, all of the Sopranos will die in. Yep. I can assure you. Yeah. <laughs> It's the, pa- tenor, the tenor in the Sopranos destiny is to be dead by the end of the uh, yeah. show. So. <laughs> How about uh, in a time like right now where obviously a lot of live performances are not happening for someone that wants to learn a little bit more experience opera, obviously they can go to YouTube. Is that quite the same experience? It's, it's probably not, but it's l- no, at least no. something that I mean, they can it- do. Yeah, no, it, it, it's not the same experience, but uh, m- a lot of people are intimidated because they think they got to have to wear it because you see on TV people in tuxes and gowns and it's a really big, you know, hullabaloo yep. and only the rich and whatever. That's really not opera anymore. Opera, mm-hmm. you can go in your jeans. Uh, yeah. You totally can go in your jeans, but I, I would, and, and you don't have to be rich. I mean, tickets can be pricey, but you have to consider sure. that what you're seeing probably cost $100,000 to mount, mm-hmm. you know? It's not your kid's high school. <laughs> Uh, production it's right it's some serious serious production there yep. and um and, and maybe even more than a hundred thousand amount mm. I mean, it could probably a lot more than that sure um but but i would say right now you know the met metropolitan opera has all kinds of things that they're streaming and that they're they Good. you know because of it so i would i would say go there yeah. for, see what you can see and yep and uh and see if you you know if you love it i mean Mm. not every art form is everybody's cup and tea uh, right i I get that but but certainly don't discount it unless you've seen seen it Mm. firsthand so anyway we we digressed a little bit from the question (laughs) i tend to go down rabbit holes (laughs) well from there i i you know um was singing and 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 ended up a single mom and um went back to school to get a pedagogy degree Mm -hmm. how you teach voice and and studied pedagogy and vocal science and found out that i really love the science of that Mm. and all uh, acoustical science and physics and and the physiology of singing i i dig it i can geek out on that for Mm. a really long time yeah and uh, so many things that were said to me in a, in a, you know, artistic way, like sing out of the top of your, a hole out of the top of your head. Yep. I don't know. You know, I never really got that. It wasn't concrete enough for me. So when I began to study the science of it, I was like, Oh, this is why they wanted me to mm. do that. Or this is why they wanted me to think about singing in the mask or whatever. Yeah. So, I, I, um, a lot of, a lot of things really clicked for me as a, as a, a coach and a teacher, as well as a singer, um, through the study of the science of the voice. Mm. So anyway, I ended up getting a doctorate and, and, and I ended up going into higher ed. I'm raising kids. I'm, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a single parent mm-hmm. and at the time and I'm, I'm raising my kids and I'm trying to find a way to, um, you know, have them a be able to do the same things that a lot of their friends can do and sure. play playing for sports. I had two boys. They love sports. So paying the price for them yep. to be in sports and travel basketball and travel soccer, yeah. all the things that adds up. 
Yes, it does. So instead of girls and buying shoes and dresses and whatever, I'm paying for sports stuff. Right. And uh, so I, I went back to school to get a, a doctorate in voice and uh, so that I could support my children mm-hmm. and, and go into higher ed. So that's, that's, that's what, I, what I ended up doing and still singing. I'm, a, I'm what you call a performing teacher. Mm-hmm. So still doing singing. And um, uh, then about three years ago, I ended up in a lot of pain. Mm. And I was stage directing an opera on my back on the stage floor because I could wow. not stand up. And, wow. and giving direction in that way because I was in such debilitating pain. And I would sit in my car and sob at the thought of getting out of my mm. car and walking to my office. I was in such terrible pain. Oh, no. So, yeah, I went, to the, I went to my primary care physician who was like, you have bursitis of the hip. Because I, I'm really active, so I'd been mm-hmm. walking like five and six miles a day. Yep. And, um, and doing, you know, kayaking and all of that. And she was like, you just really have done too much. And, and I told her, that's not my problem. I don't know what it is, but that's not it. But, you know, she, she thought that she had it pegged and she gave me a shot, didn't help. And so I went back to her and said, you're going to send me to an orthopedic uh, guy and I want an MRI and I want, mm-hmm. and I want an x-ray. And if you don't do that, I'm going to leave here and find a physician who will. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she was like, oh, well, okay. I mean, we'll get to the bottom of it. So yep. I went and they said, you have stenosis of the spine. You have a synovic cyst. Mm. Um, We're going to need to fuse four of your vertebrae. And we're going to want to do that next week because you're not going to be get any better. Oh my goodness. Yes. And you're going to, um, if you don't do this, you will begin to lose uh, control of your bowels. Wow. And you're going to be in a wheelchair. And I was Oh my gosh. (laughs) No, we're not. Thank goodness. <laughs> we are not going to do that. Yeah. I've known too many singers who have had back surgery and then never sing another note yep. and are in chronic pain forever. Yep. And not get to and, and end up on, you know, painkillers and the whole bit. Yep. And I was like, this is not going to, this is not going to happen to me. Mm-hmm. So I started listening to some health podcasts and, trying to, you know, looking online and trying to figure out like what the root cause was. I wasn't, mm-hmm. and, and of course they wanted to put me on all kinds of nerve medicine and all kinds of, you know, threw a bunch of pharmaceuticals at me. And I'm mm-hmm. like looking at the side effects and going, no, and ripping yeah. up that, that, you know, n- no, and ripping up that prescription. And I yep. just like, no, not taking any of it. I'm, yeah. No way I'm going to stand in front of a class and not be able to talk because I can't, brain wise, I can't function. And that's what's one of the side effects of the medication they were trying to put me on. So it's like, no, it's not happening. So I read Dr. Gundry's book, mm. uh, you know, the plant paradox. Yep. I eliminated every threw crap away out of my kitchen. I mean, I didn't care if I'd never been opened. I probably threw away five or $600 worth of food, wow. threw it out of the house, threw away anything that would crap in it. Um, went on an anti-inflammatory sort of journey of Mm -hmm. nothing but bland stuff (laughs) for a while. And then I begin to add my favorite things in and go, oh, nope, that causes me a problem. Nope, that causes me a problem. Mm -hmm. And figured out what what it was that was causing inflammation in my voice. Wow. And then in the meantime, I um, listened to a very famous podcaster, um, who we both know, you know, the grandfather of biohacking, they like to call him. And I listened to a bunch of his guests and was like, huh, well, this is really, really interesting. Yep. And um, I wonder if I took some of these things that they're talking about, what that would also do. Mm. I started taking some stuff that's known to uh, support connective tissue Okay. Um, rid, rid the body of inflammation. I went down the intermittent fasting, you know, uh, uh, went down that whole rabbit hole. Yep. And th- oh, thankfully so. I'm a firm believer in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had always been a low carb girl. After sure. my 
were born, I really had a hard time um, getting rid of like the belly fat and that sort of thing. So I took up kickboxing and, um, and somebody mentioned something about, and I still wasn't losing the weight. And I was mm -hmm. like, what's happening? I don't understand. So somebody mentioned something about carbs and I was like, what is, what do you mean carbs? I thought <laughs> it was fat. I don't need any fat. Right. And so I looked at my diet and I was like having a bagel in the mornings. And then I was having, you know, like a sandwich with tuna fish on it or whatever, yep. you know, and then at dinner, uh, we would have spaghetti or mm -hmm. something like that because there's no fat, no fat yep. in it. Yep. <laughs> it's funny how we're sold that too, right? You know, remove all fat from your diet. Oh, yeah. So, so then I went on a low carb diet and got off sugar and, um, it, it, it completely got off sugar and did it for six weeks during a Lent period, mm -hmm. right? And dropped the weight like wow. that. And also was like, huh, you know, I feel really, really good. Mm. Amazing. Like, hmm, okay, I feel, I feel good. This, this is really great. And somebody gave me one of those giant chocolate bunnies for Christmas. I mean, for <laughs> her. Yep. <laughs> And I ate that stupid thing. <laughs> and the next day I felt like I had a hangover. Oh and my goodness. Like, oh my Lord. I feel terrible. Yeah. Why my God. did I eat that stupid bunny? So from there on, it was like, you know, kind of low carb. Yep. I really hadn't discovered the fat thing yet, but I but I was like low carb, no sugar. I threw all the white sugar out of the house. I was pretty conscious of what I ate. Sure. Up until I read Gundry's book, right? And mm -hmm. um, so, and now I, you know, I eat fat like it's going out of, out of style. I mean, right. there, my morning starts with MCT oil and all mm -hmm. the things. And I don't shy away from any any fat that's good for me. Not yep. not palm oil or you know all those things. Not that stuff that's terrible for you. But but um, so it. It, it wasn't that I, I didn't, wasn't conscious of health. It was just mm -hmm. that I didn't, I also didn't realize, you know, about glyphosate or mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the general public. And I'm an intelligent, educated person. Yeah. You, if, unless you really look for those things, you don't know them. You, it's remarkable it, how much it's hidden. I mean, you mentioned sugar and we all know that there's sugar in the American standard American diet, but there's a ton of sugar that you don't even think about unless you're really looking into the packages and, and really looking into the foods that you're eating. Right. And same thing with glyphosate. I mean, I, I've been kind of exposed to that, you know, that exposure of knowledge uh, really in the last year of how much glyphosate is in so many different products and the, the foods that we get at our grocery store. And uh, it just, it's, it's almost like it's everywhere and it's kind of scary. It's very scary uh, to think how harmful so many things are that we have in our daily lives and our daily products. And we don't even necessarily realize it. Oh yes. And so, uh, I, there's nothing that comes in this house that I don't read the label. Mm -hmm. on. I know exactly what I'm eating. It doesn't, yep. it doesn't come in the house and it doesn't go in my mouth. Yep. And, um, and, and so I'm happy to report Dan that I feel amazing that Good. I have gone back to being the very active person that I was prior to the, to the back issue. Now I will tell you that I know when something has caused me inflammation mm -hmm. because that's the first place it shows up in my body. Yep. So I know when I'm like, Hmm, okay, what did I do or eat yesterday or, mm. or you know, last week or whatever that might be doing this to me. And so I'm really very cognizant of it. It's not like I, it's not like I figured it out and then went, okay, I'm good now. I, it, mm. it is a constant thing, but no one is opening up my spine. I can tell you that as long as I have life and breath in me to to take care of myself and take care of my my body, that's not yep. going to happen. So I went on what I would call the voice protocol, the healthy voice protocol. Now I'm making that up because that's my <laughs> that's going to be my trademark soon. And um, <laughs> and so like it's it. a protocol of food is medicine. It's a yep. protocol of um, of certain supplements that that support muscle and connective tissue health mm -hmm. and um and support um 
and of course, intermittent fasting. And, and I, I also add that I do a five day fast once a quarter. Okay, cool. That's intense. Yeah. But it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I want to kind of touch on, well, there's a lot of I, I want to touch on here, but let's get into the fasting a bit. So you do a five day fast once a quarter. Yes. Let's let's start with that. Uh, how long have you been doing that for? And then like, what are some of the main benefits you're seeing? How, how are you feeling? What was it like when you first started? Um, because I, for me, I've, ne- I've never tried to fast that long. Mm-hmm. Uh, the longest I've done is 48 hours. Um, and I'm sure for a lot of people that are listening, they're like, well, five hours or five, five days, that's a long time. Like, how does somebody even feel after that? So can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah. So, um, it's fairly new in my life. So I'm not going to say I've, you know, done it. I've done it for years. I haven't, it's, it's, it's fairly new. Um, and, uh, I've done, I did it once and I'm doing it again. And it's my new pledge cool. doing it once a quarter because of the way I felt when I was done. It was pretty, mm. it's pretty intense. So, um, I have, I'm a 16, eight person, seven days yep. a week, uh, cool. unless there's something going on. Like I go home and visit my family or whatever. And they're like, let's go to breakfast. And then yep. I'm not going to be that party person or that, that ridiculous person. Who's like, no, I'm <laughs> right. that's sure. You know, I'm not going to be who I am. I'm not going to inconvenience everybody else. Of course. For my own sake. But um, so uh, I knew I wanted to do a longer fast. So I sort of, well, one time I did it for 24 hours and I was like, mm-hmm. okay, that wasn't so terrible. And then I, and then again, I tried it later and I did it for 48 hours. And I was like, oh, well, that was hard, but okay. Then I had a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, actually the co-author of my book, uh, mine mindfulness of singing <laughs> very cool I'll plug there um and we uh she said i know of something called prolon and it's an mimic it's a it's an uh fasting mimicking uh protocol or diet mm. okay it's you order it from them they they send you a beautiful box full of the things five days worth of these things that you do and it's designed to uh, now, and now it's not, it's six, six or 800 calories at the most. So it's okay. not much calories. Sure. And they're in the way of like some soup kinds of, th- some, some soup kinds of things, some drink, mm-hmm. thing, um, a few, uh, kale cracker, you know, it's olives, things that have really good fat. Sure. No, but like no protein, no carbs. Mm. It's sort of the same thing that you would do if you were like intermittent fasting and you got up that morning and you drank a bulletproof coffee or something, yep. something that supports the fast, Sure. but the body doesn't recognize as, as food. It doesn't mm. recognize bringing nutrients into the body, Okay. but it, it does help you a little bit. So day one, I was like, yeah, I'm, hu- I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. This day two, I was like, Oh, I'm so hungry. <laughs> oh, I'm really hungry. And I so look forward to that little package of olives, right? Yep. <laughs> day, I never knew I was going to love olives so much. <laughs> and day three, I'm, I'm thinking, huh, okay, I'm not hungry. I'm not really mm. that hungry anymore. Yep. Uh, all right. So th- this is good. I can do this. I can do this. And I wear an aura ring. Mm-hmm. So I'm tracking my sleep. My deep sleep is like out of this world. I'm like sleeping so well. And wow. And and that's big for me because I'm very protective of my sleep. As a yep. singer, when you don't sleep, the first thing that goes is the voice. Yep. So I'm really, really sleep oriented. And uh, I, I can't believe how well I'm sleeping. I feel the so the fourth day I'm like I think I could run a marathon wow and I tell my husband I'm like we're going on a four mile walk (laughs) he's like what (laughs) and my friend was like I don't know if you should do that I'm like nope we're doing it I'm so we went on a four mile I I probably could have walked more than that Mm -hmm. it and I live in Virginia so Mm -hmm. You know, it's this. It's not yep. a four mile walk in Oklahoma. It's a four right. mile walk in the, you know, Very hilly. Blue Ridge Mountains. So yep. I'm like stunned by how good I feel, how much energy I have. And then um, 
by the fourth and fifth days, so what's happening is you're making stem cells mm -hmm. and you're producing human growth hormone. Hmm. You think about for somebody like me who is suffering with some spine issues, stem cells are huge. Yep. And, um, and so I, uh, I'm trying to think about what the fifth day for, oh, so the fourth night, because I'm making human growth hormone, you know, back in our paleo days, we, when we made human growth hormone out of being hungry, we felt yep. the need to hunt and we, right. we get out, get up and go hunt. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a little trouble sleeping that night because I was feeling the need to do something. I mm -hmm. was, I wasn't hungry, yeah. but I was like, why? Well, because I'm making human growth hormone and my body is telling me it's time to go hunt, you know? Interesting. So, yeah. So in that way, and then, and then day five, I, so I have a special little, you know, biohacking scale that tells mm -hmm. me muscle, water, fat, by, by, you know, all of the, all the stuff. Yep. And I couldn't believe it, but my water in my water, body water had gone up mm. optimal to the little bit past, even optimal, what you want in hydration. Yep. And I went, um, I gained muscle, hmm. lost body fat, and uh, I was stunned because incredible. I really, I, it is incredible. Yeah. Really incredible. And the clarity, the mental clarity mm. that that brought for me was pretty astounding. Yeah. I noticed that mental clarity when I even just do shorter fasts, like 24 hour fast, or even just my time restricted eating of, I, I'm same with you. I, I do uh 16, eight uh, of my eating window. And uh, I just noticed like my mental clarity is, is improved. So I can only imagine after five days what that's like. And I also find it really fascinating. I think most people, when they hear a fast of that long, whether it's 48 hours or, or five days, their first thought is probably that your hunger is going to grow and grow and grow as the days go on. And I find it really interesting by that third day, you actually, it like goes away. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's not even bothering you. So yeah. I, I just, it's just remarkable to think what our human body and our minds can do. Yeah, I would, um, you know, I mean, I'm not, t I'm not going to say I wasn't looking forward to those olives. I was. Sure, sure. But, you know, in a lot of ways, eating is about m mouthfeel, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. about texture. It's about the experience, the sensual experience of food. Right. It's always about being hungry or we wouldn't eat unless we were hungry, right? Yep. yep. So, so, you know, yeah, sure. I mean, I missed having something crunchy. You know, my husband would come in with all of his crappy food but i feel like, <laughs> i feel like he's like i'm sorry is this bothering you and i'm like no not really yeah I'm good i That's can't great. but i'm good yep very cool so then with fasting so you do a five day fast once a quarter you do your uh your time restricted on a daily basis um with the 16 8 right is that what you said your 16 8 window mm -hmm. are you incorporating any other kind of fasting or is, is that the extent and then that's plenty um, that's more than most people i didn't what know if there's anything else. Me, <laughs> <laughs> no i think that's that's really cool the, the five days something i'm going to be looking into like i said the most i've done is 48 hours and uh i felt good you know i i, I just haven't explored more than that so that's something i'll be looking into yeah, I, um, I kind of want to recap some of the things that you've talked about, and then I want to get into breath work as well, because I know that's a big piece of what you do with vocal performance. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to just for our listeners to kind of recap everything that you've talked about in terms of some of the main things that you did to reduce your inflammation, to boost your energy, to kind of heal your yourself. So we've talked about fasting is a big thing. Nutrition was a big thing. Um, you said you basically reduced or eliminated carbs you increased fats uh you reduced sugar what else was it in your diet that you kind of focused on well well a, a little bit of that's not true because i i had i had always been a person who didn't eat carbs okay but but um m much at all like i'm okay bread and sugar and pasta and those things i i've given up like really yep. not e eating eating them okay but, but I have to say, so one of the things that I have suffered with too is, and singers suffer with this, and it's called mm -hmm. acid reflux, a little bit of GERD, you know, and singers suffer with it a lot 
And it's because of um, the way that we breathe and be- the way that we punish our bodies when we sing, when we're singing mm. in, in many ways. I, I do think um, that the traditional um, teaching of that causes mm-hmm. a lot of singers to become overwrought in their breath. Okay. And I, 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 I shy away from that a little bit. I'm not, I don't teach the traditional breath breath technique of yep. taking in as much air as you possibly can and now push the body into mm. an extreme position because uh, especially the pulling in or, you know, because that pushes the, the diaphragm right in to the thorax, which then yep. will can cause great stress to the stomach and cause splashing of a- acid into the, into the larynx trachea. Mm-hmm. And that's death for a singer. Okay. Uh, prolong of that is if you don't, and there's such a thing as silent bird mm-hmm. or acid reflux. People don't know that they have it until wow. it's like, wow. uh, to, to really rehabilitate the voice, uh, much. So, um, I was still suffering a little bit from having like a lot of indigestion and, mm-hmm. and just, my, my back pain was better, but I was, so I decided, and I know this is really controversial and there are a lot of biohackers who don't believe this, mm-hmm. but here's one of the things that I have definitely learned through teaching voice. No two people are the same. You yep. cannot teach the voice the exact same to every person that walks in your room. If you do, right. you're doing a huge disservice. Yep. We are not the same. We are not built the same. We don't have the same genetic composition. Mm. We don't have the same. My larynx is not the size of your larynx. I mean, yep. it's just not feasible to teach that exactly the same. Just I'm really happy you mentioned that. I, I think that can go for a lot of things too in health in general. I guess the biohacking world, but health in general, like nutrition for one is a big piece where like you have these like kind of tribes of like paleo and, and, uh, keto and, oh, and yeah. vegan and vegetarian it, it, and like carnivore over it. And if they're in it, they're like, this is the diet for everybody. And that's just not the case. There's no two people like everyone has their own needs. So, no. so I read a book called eat right for your type. Yep. Now I should tell you that I've read like 60 books since COVID. <laughs> Very cool. That's awesome. Very, <laughs> that's, I've a always, lot of books. Yeah, yeah. No, not, not, some of them I've not read from front to cover because I got into them and was like, yeah, no, you know. Sure. I read something else. But, yeah. but I have looked at or and looked into a, about 60 books last That's I can. That's huge. That's more than like one a week, right? If yes. You think of yeah. from March until yeah. now. What else am I going to do? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you can only watch so much Netflix. Not watching a lot of Netflix, so right. I'm not a TV person much. So mm-hmm. um, I I just really trying to, and I've always been a lifelong learner, love school, you know, love love that, but um, mm-hmm. like wanted to really look into all the things, biohacking wise and yeah. mental hacking and mindfulness and all of that. So, yeah. um, and I so I, I picked up a book called Eat Right for Your Type, and I read it, and I knew my blood type, and I thought this is interesting. And I got to the part of my blood type and I handed it to my husband and said, so I'm going to tell you all the things that caused me to have acid reflux. Mm-hmm. You're going to tell me, I said, let's see if this is the real deal. And I'm in, I'm in Barnes and Noble, right? Like yeah. I'm not, I'm, I didn't buy it yet. I'm going to, I'm thinking about buying it, but I just yep. wanted, this is my test to see if it's full of it or if it's, it's real. And I said, here are the things I don't do well on. See if it's on my don't eat list. And I start naming the things. And he's like, yep, yep, yep. Wow. Yep. Hmm. Maybe grab, the, grab the book, you go to the checkout line. <laughs> so I, go to the, I buy it. And lo and behold, Dan, I don't have one bit of acid reflux unless I eat something that's on that list of what I should not eat. Wow. That's now, whether cool. that's true for everybody, I can't say. Sure. So I have gone back to eating some carbs because mm-hmm. for my blood type, I'm supposed to stay away from meat. Got it. So I dabble in vegetarianism. I, I, and when I say dabble, it's because I will eat fish. Yep. And I'm more pescatarian. I eat a lot of fish. Mm-hmm. And occasionally I will have, because I love it, 
the 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 um, grass fed, grass finished beef yep. that I buy from mm-hmm. you know, a popular person that will ship it to you. Mm-hmm. I, I buy that for my husband because he has a very different blood type that says eat meat. So mm-hmm. that's our compromise. He has meat, and I yep. and I've kind of gone down, and it's really interesting when I just started doing that. Um, I keep getting smaller. I'm not counting calories. I'm not, not eating carbs. Incredible. I keep getting smaller and I can't get much smaller. I'm only, uh, <laughs> I like to say I'm five foot three. Right? Yeah. You're looking great. You really, I mean, I, I can tell like you can see like in your, your skin looks healthy. You look lean, like it, you look healthy, which is probably yeah. a big part of the nutrition. <laughs> Right. It's the, it's the healthy. I'm not a, I'm not a big proponent of count calories and do a diet. Like that's such baloney. What you're saying, it, it, it makes it simplified. I think, right? Like I think we've made nutrition kind of so complex and it sounds like what you've learned through a lot of trial and error. And then also from this book is just like simplifying things down to this is what I should be eating and what I shouldn't be eating. Right. And anything that causes you to burp, or have mm. you know uh, um, gas, if you yep. will. That's what a burp is. But but gas in any form, yep. uh, uh, other than your normal, what you should do as a human. Right. But but uh, in anything that causes you bloating or mm. feeling the next morning like you need to clear your throat, <clears throat> like you have something on your folds, you don't know mm. what you think maybe it's sinus drainage, you don't really realize. Anything that causes you that, you should pay attention to. As, yep. as a person, a professional voice user should definitely be paying attention to that because yeah. the voice is, you know, that's part of the road of, of food and digestion. Mm-hmm. And if some part of that doesn't work, then, then the trachea and the folds get involved in that digestive process and it's terrible for you. Mm, yeah. What was the name of the book again? You said eat, eat for your type. Eat right for your type. Okay. So it, it looks at all the blood types. Okay. And th- there will be people out there who will say, who, who will probably comment and go, that's a <laughs> bunch of crap ever, blah, 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 blah. But all I'm telling you is that I feel amazing. Mm-hmm. And if anything, it's a step in the right direction for people that may be completely lost and feel like they have no resource, they have no hope, they, are, they just don't know where to go. Like I said earlier, like it might just be so complex. It sounds and- like this is a good solution to at least get into the right direction. Right. And if you're a singer and you're on and you're a young singer and, mm-hmm. and you and I, I've seen it all the time where I teach, I'll have a student who's having some vocal problems. I'll say, go see your doctor, have them do a scope. Yep. They inevitably go to a certain kind of doctor, but not an otolaryngologist who mm-hmm. I, they should all see an otolaryngologist. They go to a certain kind of doctor. And then that doctor will give them a clean bill of health and they'll mm. keep having vocal problems, keep having vocal problems until they go to an otolaryngologist who will say, you have silent reflux. Mm. And they're 21 years old. And now that doctor oh. is put them on uh, uh, acid reflux medicine, you know, mm-hmm. counter acid reflux medicine, a whole bunch of it. And that medicine is linked to all kinds of health problems down the road. All kinds of stuff, yeah. All kinds of stuff. And that's just and a I, cycle. You're young. You're 20. You shouldn't be on any medication as a 20-year-old. Exactly. I'm, I, you know, I'm in my 50s. I don't, when I go to the doctor, people are like, so what medication are you on? I'm like, <laughs> none. None. Zero. It's my diet. Yep. I'm like, what do you mean zero? Aren't you on blood pressure? No. Aren't you on cholesterol? No. Mm. Aren't you on acid reflux? No. You're not. I mean, they're so shocked. Yeah. The intake person, you know, they're always so shocked that I'm not yeah. on medication. And then I give them my list of supplements, and they're like, "What? <laughs> what? What are you taking?" So on that note, uh, let's talk about supplements because I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of certain supplements. Um, what are some that you really like and f- you know find good benefits from? Well, I'll tell you right now. Um, Hyaluronic acid and uh, glucosamine are my two best friends. Cool. Uh, connective tissue rebuilders, big time. Yep. Uh, I take boron because mm-hmm. it's also a bone and, uh, you know, 
connective tissue support. I take quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. I, um, and it depends on what we're talking about Sure. You know, for those kinds. That's what I take for those kinds of things. Okay. Um, for aging and for skin, I take a lot of collagen and I take mm -hmm. a lot of, which also helps with connective tissue. So collagen, 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 bone broth, those kinds yep. of things. See, and that's where I get away a little bit from the meat thing, but mm -hmm. anyway, um, but but, you know, grass fed, grass finished, some collagen or marine collagen. I have a ton of marine collagen in my mm. kitchen. Um, I add it to everything. Um, I take a lot of omega-3 um, and I take, you know, D3 and I take yep. vitamin K mm -hmm. and uh, I take a ton of magnesium, probably yep. in the thousand milligrams, um, but not just your basic old magnesium that you buy you know, that will irritate your stomach. Yep. I, I take uh, other forms depending on mm -hmm. what I'm doing. And um, I take some adrenal cocktails to help with the, because ma the magnesium can kind of stress you out a little bit. Yep. Um, and I take uh, glutathione and I take uh, NAD, N-A-D. And um, what else? Oh, I, I occasionally dabble into some diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. and I'm always, this is full of mineral trace. Um, and then at night before I go to bed, I take valerian and some ashwagandha and, mm -hmm. uh, and I take um, some more MCT oil and uh, a little bit of CBD and mm -hmm. uh, some magnesium glycinate and some glycine. I sweeten my tea with about five grams of glycine. I love it sleep like a baby and get about an hour and 20 minutes of deep sleep. Love that. You have a lot covered there. I mean, that's, that's a really good extensive list of, of supplements and for a variety of reasons, like you said, like it depends on what you're looking for, what you need. It seems like you got most of everything that you need covered there. Um, the two that I don't think I heard that I do like to take and again, it depends on each person and their diet because they may get these things in their diet mm -hmm. that I'm probably not getting enough of. So I, I take it through supplements as zinc and vitamin B12. Oh, um, I take both those. I'm sorry. I do. Yeah. Okay. I kind of figured it sounded like you had like every single <laughs> supplement covered. So <laughs> I take related zinc and I take a method okay. mixture of all the, tw all the Bs. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I figured as much based on what you were saying, it seemed like you had pretty much the whole uh, spectrum covered there, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, but again, like I said, the big thing is that like everyone's got their own needs and, uh, it depends on what it is that you're looking for. You know, each one serves a purpose. And also, as you know, like there's supplements, they're meant to supplement your, your diet and your yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. So that means, you know, you can get a lot of those things from the diet that you have, but you may be lacking certain things and that's where supplements come in. So I don't want people to think like, oh, I can just well, take all Americans these things. Are lacking in, yeah, are, yeah. I mean, Americans are lack, lacking in a lot of things, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's where I think supplements can be a really great thing. So um, mm -hmm. cool. What else with, with health that we haven't covered um, that maybe you wanted to touch on that you are big into? Yeah, so breath work, it, you know, is, is the other element because mm – -hmm. One of the things that we know through imaging and, and you know things like that in the in the voice world is and, and through through people who studied respiration and respiratory therapists and and you know respiratory medical professionals will tell you that as you age after mm -hmm. about age three, the the respiratory system begins to decline mm -hmm. and and that when you once you get past forty it declines pretty drastically. And once you're around my age, you, you lose about 40% of your ability to, to uh, breathe and wow. to breathe well. The, the rib cage becomes stiff and, and just like everything else, right? Uh, stiff and um, inflexible. And you need the flexibility in the rib cage right. for optimal breath. So, yep. You know, when you take that breath, the rib cage spreads, right? Causes this vacuum along with the mm -hmm. diaphragm lowering. But if this spread doesn't happen as well, then you don't take in the kind of breath that you need to. And if you're an extreme singer, like an opera singer, or or and even even in jazz, like mm -hmm. there's some pretty, 
pretty long phrases in jazz, but but either way, if you're if if you or if you're a speaker and you're discovering mm-hmm. that you talk, but at the ends of the phrases you start to run out of air, yep. and you're in this age bracket, then this is probably part of the reason. Mm. And it could be a lot of things. It could be inefficient use of air. It could be inefficient vocal technique, even through yep. speech. But but certainly certainly air is the is the power force behind the voice. So if you're not making great air or you're not able to deal with your air very well, then the voice will definitely suffer. Mm-hmm. So when that can't spread, when those uh, muscles between the rib cage and around the rib cage can't spread and give flexibility in this way, yep. then the voice suffers, breath suffers, and respiration is so hooked to, is so hooked to metabolic function. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you aren't breathing while well, all those millions and millions of cells that you have aren't breathing well either. Yep. And so breath is as vital as nutrition. Mm. For and general health, right? For general health. I mean, yep. if you're a singer, for sure. But, it, but, but for general health, absolutely. Yeah. Your breath isn't correct and isn't done, um, isn't efficient. Or if you are a mouth breather and you don't breathe through mm. your nose, that's all hugely problematic to your metabolic health. Yeah. And, um, so I teach uh, a variety of kinds of breath work. I, I love okay. Wim Hof. I love, you know, all those, that, that whole space. That, I mm-hmm. mean, he's, he's a god. I, I understand that. <laughs> um, but, but that doesn't really work for singing so well. Sure. I mean, it works for other things, but it doesn't really work it's, for singing so well. It's probably a good framework for anybody, but yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think what you're going to say is like you need certain things for vocal performance. So sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and not just vocal performance. I mean, even for just speech and, and mm-hmm. speaking. So yep. actors, educators, podcasters, people who you need to use their voice professionally and need to know that when they open their mouth mm-hmm. to do this thing that they do professionally, that it's going to work. It's dependable. They're yes. not run out of air. They're not going to be, you know, feeling distressed when they're done mm-hmm. or having it crack or do some unpredictable things Sure, um, that, that can happen, especially if you're a little bit nervous and air isn't, flowing as well because that's one of the first things that goes you're nervous Mm -hmm. um but but uh uh singers often have you know some stage fright and stage anxiety and and the over breathing that we tend to teach in that space of teaching singers can really also increase and tweak that sense of anxiety Mm. so uh i teach my um clients to uh learn to breathe what i what what patrick McEwen calls light and right okay um and i i don't know if you know who he is but he's the guy who wrote a book called oxygen advantage and and um it, it's this sense of of letting the diaphragm and the rib cage do what it does naturally right and then being very good at exhalation where that mm. it, where it's a steady good stream but if you are really really addicted to oxygen and mm-hmm. your your body screaming you need to breathe it's because mm. you aren't making enough and not used to having some co2 in the system yep and you need some co2 in the body to be able to put off that feeling of breath hunger right as a singer I- I think that's a big piece a lot of people forget or they don't realize the importance of is that exhale. They think with breath work, it's like all inhale and like it's the importance of breathing in and they don't realize how important it is to properly exhale. Yes. Exhalation is huge. And you're exhaling when you speak. Right. Or sing. Uh, anytime you use, anytime phonation occurs, mm-hmm. this is something that is... Uh, respiration you know exhalation related Mm -hmm. and um if you can talk for or sing for a really long time without taking a breath then you're doing you're doing pretty well most people can't 
cannot do that. But anyway, so I, I have, uh, along with my colleague, we've developed a kind of a breath work that we've worked for, for people who are voice users that um, require some sensory deprivation. Mm. Um, they take their breath through the nose and then they mm. sing and or hum for their exhalation. And we work on getting those ex- that exhalation as long as absolutely possible before they take another breath. Mm. And the breath is not huge. It's, it, you engage the rib cage Yep. And you let the diaphragm fall in its own way, as opposed to sucking air in. You you try to tweak the nature of it just a little bit, get the rib cage to get engaged, the diaphragm to go down, and and your body will take in breath absolutely, absolutely in the most natural way in that way, and fully take it in. Yes, I mean, especially so, as you practice it more. I've noticed, like as I practice it more, it becomes much more natural. Yes. So do me a favor. Mm-hmm. Take a deep breath. Okay. And okay, let me tell you the whole thing first and then do it. Okay, you tell me so, that. <laughs> you're going to take in a deep breath and you're going to hold that breath. Yep. You're going to hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And not after an exhale, but on the inhale and then hold okay. the breath. And so, and the minute you begin to feel tension here or in the body somewhere, and this may take you a while because if you do breath work, you, you might be able to do this quite a while. Yeah. But when, once you feel that tension, just let go. Don't, don't purposely take in air. Just let go and relax and notice what okay. happens. All right. We're doing this. We're doing this right now. Yep. Ready? Okay. Go. I do want to say I, I practice the Wim Hof method quite a bit, so this might take a while. <laughs> okay. Okay. So deep breath in and hold, and then and then once What's I feel, about, it's not about how long you can hold it. It's when you feel a little tension. Like okay. Feel some tension. And then just and, naturally let it. And then just relax. Don't try to okay. take breath in. Just relax. Okay. And if and if I want to say too, if you're listening to this and and you're not driving or operating a vehicle, uh, maybe you can practice along with us right yeah. now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what happened? Uh, I felt definitely like a tingling sensation. Um, I felt a natural release of like stress and any kind of like pressure I had. Mm-hmm. I felt very easy. Yeah. yeah. Did you have to work at taking the breath in afterwards? No. Not I did notice I worked, um, I think, because I was like already talking before I took the breath in, the initial oh, breath in. Okay. I didn't get a full like deep breath that I maybe wanted. Um, but after that exhale, it was like I forgot I was breathing. But I was still like a, it was still like a very easy, natural breathing from there. Right. So one of the things that I like to teach my, my clients to do is to hold that tension a little bit and then relax. Don't talk, but you know, relax. Yep. And when they relax, air just rushes into the body without them mm. having to think about it or yep. pull the air in or suck the air in. And they're stunned by it. Right. They're stunned that, and as singers and speakers and people who, you know, have been told, you know, breathe with the diaphragm, which is a bunch right. of crap, by the way. <laughs> um, it, when you're taught that you you then turn you know the autonomic part of breath off mm-hmm. and may and then you have to make it this conscious effort for talking or singing sure and and it becomes really inefficient because you're fighting the very nature of what it is you're supposed to be doing mm. and that is letting the autonomic system do its job yes Yes, it's beautiful. It's it's remarkable. And I, I find what I like about what you're saying is this is stuff that anybody can use in their daily life. You know, it's not just for singers or people that, that focus on, on voice, um, although a lot of people do, like myself, podcasters, and you said people that give speeches. But this is something that you can incorporate into your life, you know, even if you go into a conversation that you're nervous about, um, to really use this as a tool. And I've been using this as a tool for myself. I remember the first like four or five podcast interviews I, I did when I first started the podcast, I was super nervous. Um, and I still get a little bit nervous, like right before we start. 
just because you don't necessarily know the person well, you don't know how it's going to go. You don't know if they're going to have good conversation, if they're going to be able to like follow up with, with a lot of good conversation. Um, but I remember those first four or five interviews, I was real nervous to get started. And then I eventually, you know, came across breathing. And now before I hit record and even before, you know, you hop on the zoom call with me, I just stand here and I do basic breath breath work and it helps a lot to calm those nerves. Yeah. I've started incorporating it in every, in the, in the, in the higher ed at the university where I teach, mm -hmm. I've been incorporating it into that with all of my young singers who, who right now in, well, not right now, over the last two to three years, one of the things educators have noticed is that anxiety disorders have, are really gone up in the, yes. in the space for, generation uh, Z and, and younger millennials uh, mm. really suffer from some anxiety disorders. So um, it's it's one of the things that I do before I ever even have them sing. I'm like, okay, so right now we're going to do breath of fire. Three minutes, yep. here we go. And yep. they do that and they're like in such a much better place mentally to mm. to do to do the to do some some singing. I'm happy you talked and mentioned about the uh the mental health aspect of things and what I love just in general about health is how much everything is interconnected. So today we've talked about nutrition, we've talked about movement, we've talked about breath work, we've talked about supplements. Um, and now we're talking a little bit about mental health and how this can help reduce stress. We've already talked about how it, you know, reduces, uh, nerves. Um, and we're living in a world, we already know this, where there's, a lot of issues with, with mental health, you know, and, and we can go down a whole other rabbit hole of like reasons why, um, in terms of, you know, modern, our modern lifestyle and, and technology and social media and that fast paced living that we have, that lifestyle that we have. And then not to mention 2020 and all of the other added stress that we've had just from this year alone. Um, so what, what's great about this is that you can use this, like I said, as, as a tool, um, but I just love that it's also interconnected with, with mental health, nutrition, breath work, so many other things. It's really fascinating. Yeah. I, and I, I, um, w one of the other things that's in our book that's coming out next in 2021, yeah. uh, we, one of the other things we talk about is using singing for meditation and mm. the meditation, a whole thing on how to sing and meditate at the same time. And I, it's powerful. Your yeah. own voice, the power of your own voice is like, I, I totally believe that we have not really tapped that just yet. Yes. So I want to dive into that a bit. So before we kind of get into my, my question here, um, while we are talking about it, let's let's chat about the book that's coming out in spring of 2021, you said? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And the title of that will be, you said, The, the Mindfulness the of Singing. Singing, A Transformative Journey Using the Power of the Voice. Cool. And it's all around mind, body, spirit, and of course, like I said, we do we talk about breath work and and meditation and mm. kinds of things. And this is not for a professional singer, by the way. This okay. is for a person who's like, you know, I kind of always wanted to sing, yeah. and I would practice mindfulness. How could I do that? And and um, you know, gain the benefits because we know singing, singing. I mean, it it and it releases all kinds of hormones. It helps with mood. It. Yep. It, it also really helps with neuroplasticity. All mm. the things that you do when you do music really yes. make a huge difference in your brain's, you know, uh, uh, vitality and the, the neuroplasticity of all the, all the different lobes and things that are working to make music singing. And the fact mm -hmm. that we sing totally bypasses speech. I mean, that's nuts, right? Yeah. You can sing words, but not be tapped into the speech center of the brain. Mm -hmm. how interconnected the brain is and, and neuroplastic the brain is. And when singing, you do so much in that neuroplasticity uh, space. Yes. And, yes. and, and that, you know, my own father has Alzheimer's and what's mm -hmm. the one thing that he can do like he did when he was young, sing every hymn by memory. Wow. He can sing, he can sing, dad, sing, um, you know, be still my soul or whatever. And he knows every verse and every chorus. We couldn't tell you what he had for breakfast, right? Mm. And because singing is really and truly something I think that we we're supposed to use as a tribe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful like, to connect I, to each other. I think music alone, yeah, guest singing, but music in general is is very powerful for all the reasons you just mentioned. 
Um, I want to touch on you. You talked about with with your new book, you know, the idea of mindfulness with singing. Um, can you relate? So, like, when you let's take meditation. There's all kinds of different types of meditation, but uh, a very common form of meditating, something that's been you can date back hundreds, thousands of years, uh, is that idea of of a mantra um, or just that like humming or like um right, that uh, is that can you kind of connect that or correlate that to what you're talking about with singing as a form of meditation or mindfulness? Is there any kind of comparison there? Yeah, absolutely. So I, one of the reasons I think why that ancient practice of, of doing an om or doing a hum or having mm. a mantra, um, um, and even the old pranayama, um, uh, uh, Brahmari, Brahmari mm. uh, I don't know if you know that meditation, but it's humming bee meditation. So you, 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 you close the ears, you, you close the eyes and you, hmm, you know, mm. you hum. Um, you know, one of the things that that does is really calm the central nervous system. You know, okay. you get both both that uh, um, the vagus the vagus nerve. I mean, yep. all of those things get involved when you're using your voice and singing, and you are doing nothing but in that space, and you shut everything out and listen to your own mm. your own voice, which causes various vibrations throughout the the body because of something that's called sympathetic resonance. So Mm. as you move and you sing in one range, like if I were doing it, I would, you know, be like, "Mm." well, Mm. I feel all this vibration in my chest and in Mm. my neck, my ears, you know, and that's really, it's got a kind of a comforting thing to it. But then as I move up and I'm more in my speech voice, "Mm," that vibrates here and, Mm. you know, that, or, and then when I get in my head voice, you know, something to that effect, I'm not only exercising all of the voice from its a spectrum of lowest note to highest note, I'm not mm-hmm. only exercising that, but also I am um, pr- practicing that, that mindfulness of the breath work, of the exhalation, but then I'm also shutting everything out. My brain is tuned into feeling those sensations in my body, much like think going back to the breath, but mm-hmm. rather than going back to the breath through your meditation, you go back to the voice, the sound of your own voice. Yes. It's, I mean, can I get a hallelujah? It's, it's <laughs> powerful. <laughs> yeah, it sure sounds like it. Uh, and it's, it's something that might not be talked about enough. I think in the meditation and mindfulness space is that idea of a voice and vocal and, and um, people are afraid you, to sing, Dan. Yeah, they're they're yeah. going to be judged that it's yep. it's not going to be good or the you know the teacher in the third grade said go to the back row, please don't yep. sing, just move your mouth or mm. you know or or your your beautiful partner, wonderful partner says, honey, please don't sing in the car. You right. know, <laughs> you yeah. you get self conscious because our voices are us. Yes. It comes from us. It's not. Yes. Like, it's not like an extension of us, like an instrument. It. Mm. And I'm not. I'm not saying that doesn't come from people too. I'm just saying that when it comes out of your very being, the right. power of that, but also the self awareness of that yep. and nervousness of that also can come. But if you, if you want to sing and you want to, you want to get all the benefits of singing, you don't have mm-hmm. to be a good singer or a professional singer for that. Right. You can do this breath, this breath work, and this meditation. It's a it's a breathing meditation where you just you sing and get mm. all of the benefits of singing. Yeah, I love that. I'll be sure to have your uh, your new book, The Mindfulness of Singing, uh, linked up in the description and show notes. Um, is that available by chance for pre order? Is there a link I can have uh, earlier before the release date? Yeah, we'll 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 send that to you when we when we do. We're, we're in we're in some like a weird space because there are two publishers who want to publish it, but okay. we really want to hold out for a particular publisher that we've not. Sure. Okay, so as soon as that's all available, I'll have that linked up, and then of course, uh, when it, the the launch date goes live, I'll I'll have the actual uh, links yeah, I think proper my links. Partner and I can come back and talk about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. I would love that. Um, very cool. Before I get to my last question, where else can people learn more about you, find out more about uh, your work? 
Yeah. So Denise Ritter Bernardini, mm -hmm. I know it's kind of hard for people, but think <laughs> Bernard and then I and I. So like little Bernard. Okay. <laughs> Denise Ritter Bernardini dot com. And oh. right now that page will will be um it's kind of it kind of moves around the page a little bit. It, it, mm -hmm. Right now it's called Biohacking Your Voice. Okay. Because, uh, January the 2nd, I am doing a three-month class that is cool. all around biohacking the voice. So we'll talk more about food as medicine, mm -hmm. lots of recipes, lots of supplement discussion, lots of um, uh, uh, yogic mm -hmm. practices to increase the rib cage flexibility. Cool. Um, and lots of special guests in biohacking and and um, and and singing space, as well as some some uh, like Alexander technique and ego mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, cool. And uh, so yeah, that's that's a it's a three month course, and would love to have some non singers in there. People, mm, yeah. Uh, want to talk better? Want to speak better? Want to communicate better? Yes. I love it. Very cool. So I'll have that linked up as well for those that want to learn uh, more and visit your site and, and see your online courses. You have a lot there that I think can uh, help benefit a lot of people. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, my last question for you, and I understand, you know, obviously you are a vocal teacher. You fo focus on on voice and, and breathing and biohacking and just general health. Um, but who is it that you want to impact the most and, and why? What is it that uh, you want to to do and have an impact with? Well, I tell you, I feel really passionate about helping people realize that they don't have to take the norm or what people tell them is going to happen to them as they age. Mm. If I believed that, I would be in a wheelchair and I would be, you know, some wrinkled little gray haired thing. I. Yep. I, and I don't, I don't, I, I don't think people really realize how empowered they are and mm -hmm. that they can, um, when they just take the, the typical, you know, toe the line, you're aging, you have no choice. It's just part of aging. When people say that I cringe because yep. it, it, it is so not true. And part of aging, of course, is mindset and all of that. But but we tend to give away our own owner's manual. Mm. We tend to give that away to the medical profession, to to pharmaceutical, to all the big corporate whatever, you know. And we believe them, and we don't we don't um, fight what we're what we're told. We don't. Yep. We just we figure they're professionals. They know what they're talking about. I, I should listen. Exactly. So let people talk us into aging, and I I feel really passionate about getting that message out to anybody, mm -hmm. but but especially singers because Dan in the singing world, youth is everything. Youth mm. is everything. But I can tell you this. When I see a young person on an opera stage singing something like Violetta, who's dying and is it, 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 dying in part because she has lost her, her love and has given up. Not only mm -hmm. does she have consumption, you know, but, but she's given up. And, and I see a young singer sing that who has no life experience, mm -hmm. not understand what it is to lose love, to, to, to think about leaving children and those kinds of things, although Violetta's not doing that, but thinking about leaving children behind and those sorts of things, mm -hmm. as opposed to an, a singer who's got some wisdom and some age and some, some life behind them, I will choose that singer any day. Yes. And we as a society, just not only do we take that hook, line and sinker that you're aging and you have to give in to it. So just, just try to go die quietly you know, try to go go age over there in the corner because yep. you don't have much to offer us at this point because you're mm. old, right? Um, I would love to empower singers who begin to give up and let go of singing a little at a time, mm. a little bit every year because they're getting older, to not do that. Yes. To find ways to sing, to find projects to do projects you love to to keep singing no mm. matter what 
mm. keep singing. That's I love it. So that's that's my my biggest passion is to help people figure that out. It's so cool. I appreciate you sharing that. And I think what's so neat about well, there's a number of things uh, that's really neat about the conversation that we've had. Um, it's definitely an inspirational message. I think people that are listening to this that might be facing some of the same issues that you once faced uh, can hopefully see like, oh, wow, there's a real solution here. You know, there's a way that's different from what I've been told. Um, so thank you for, for being an inspiration to, to my audience. And I also love that you are relatable to a lot of people. And yes, you have your expertise in everything that we've talked about with, with voice and, and breathing, um, which tend to have kind of their own like niche in their own tribe. Right. But you've kind of opened it up to it being applicable to almost everybody. So again, thank you for, for that and that relatedness. Yeah, now more than ever, Dan, we need to sing. Yes. We need to sing together. Yes, amen. Cool. Well, Denise, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to come onto my show and, and sharing your story. Oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Mm -hmm.